Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Guppy. Uh, I, my pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm really excited to be on with every one of you at today's event. Uh, I can see that there's about 163 of you on the call already, which is quite amazing. Some of you are local, some of you are national, some of you are international longtime supporters. Some of you may be coming to a Fred Hutch event for the very first time. If you're in the chat, go ahead and put in where you're from. So click on the Q&A button on the side and put in where you're from so we can all see where everybody's from and you can get used to the Q&A tab because at the end of it, this event is about answering your question because we are deeply grateful for your interest and support of Fred Hutch. You have been some of the longest supporters uh, of our program for HSV and I look forward to spending the next hour with you. So we're gonna be joined today by Drs. Keith Jerome and Anna Wald to talk about herpes simplex virus or HSV research. You are an incredible group of people who are passionate, who are well-informed about this research and dedicated to finding a cure. Also, it cannot be understated how much of a powerhouse you all are in the fundraising world. To date, you have raised more than $1 million for HSV research since 2018. And you all represent all 50 states and 30 countries, 34 countries. And I'm seeing some of them in the chat from Australia, from Sweden, from Saudi Arabia. That's just absolutely incredible. Um, and you all make up 30% of Fred Hutch's monthly donors. So I cannot thank you enough. And you are all representative of how herpes affects billions of people around the globe and why this research is so important to those who suffer from HSV. Yet research for this, re uh, yet research funding is still not enough and it is underfunded by government grants and it's community support like yours that has been essential to keep the research going so long. So for those of you who are new to a Fred Hutch event, let me introduce you to Fred Hutch. We, Fred Hutch, are an independent nonprofit organization out in Seattle and the only National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center in Washington state. We've earned a global reputation for our track record of discoveries in cancer, infectious disease, and basic research. And we operate eight clinical care sites that provide medical oncology, infusion, radiation, proton therapy and related services. Fred Hutch also serves as UW Medicine's cancer program. We've developed cures for cancer, like the bone marrow transplant and immunotherapies and made important advances in HIV AIDS prevention and COVID-19 vaccines. And as you will hear, in HSV as well. Our history of accelerating discoveries spans almost 50 years and we are just getting started. And with that, I'm pleased to be now joined by Drs. Keith Jerome and Anna Wald. As most of you know, uh, Keith is a renowned virologist whose research focuses on viruses that persist in their hosts, such as herpes simplex virus, HIV, and hepatitis B. Welcome, Keith. Dr. Anna Wald is also a prominent epidemiologist and clinical virology researcher who has been working towards improving HSV testing and an HSV vaccine since 1991. We're gonna learn more about their groundbreaking work and get an update directly from Keith and Anna, and then we're gonna answer your questions, which is our primary objective today. So hopefully you are all now familiar with the Q&A, and I hope to see those questions continuing to come in. You can upvote or like certain questions and that will move them right up to the top of the chat. So. Your top five questions were shared ahead of time. We'll answer those first, and then we'll get to as many as we can get through that come in the chat today. So let's get started. Dr. Keith Jerome, welcome. Hello, I'm excited to be here. So um, I, from what I understand, you're hoping to publish your newest manuscript soon. And um, I was wondering whether you can give this group, which has been hoping for an update on that work for a while, a quick overview of your findings. Yeah, so, well, we were, I was kind of half hoping we could have it done by today, but we got one more step, I think, so we're, we're sending a couple last things this afternoon. Um, so the paper's going to be published. Uh, 
I think, hopefully, uh, um, in a, a journal called Nature Communications, some of the people on the call may have seen our 2020 paper there where we kind of first introduced this work. Um, so the new work really moves things to the next step. Um, and there's a couple of big findings in the paper. And frankly, some people on this call have heard some of these because it's taken a long time to get this published because this is sort of how academia works sometimes. Um, so one of the really big things is previously we had shown in our um, animal models that uh, we could treat herpes that infects around the head and face. Um, and that was quite effective and that was uh, you know, very exciting. But of course, uh, a lot of people are concerned about genital herpes. And there's a somewhat different biology there. And it's not, you can't be completely sure in one site that is going to work in another. Um, and so in this paper, we've done that. We've infected uh, animals with HSV-1 and uh, genitally and show that we can treat them there effectively. And in fact, we the, the, the treatment works even better there than it does around the head and neck. So, you know, we, we were hoping it would work as well. It actually works way better. So that's exciting. Um, second big finding in the paper is in the 2020 paper, we showed we could reduce the amount of virus that was in the nerves uh, in the ganglia where the virus hides out. But it wasn't clear what that means in terms of virus shedding when the virus wakes up and tries to come back out to the surface. And what we show in this paper is that when you reduce the virus in the ganglia, you reduce that shedding as well. And that typically, as I don't talk about, often correlates with symptomatic disease and certainly is a major driver of transmission. Um, those are a couple of really big things. Um, we've also made a third advance, which is to take what was previously a, a pretty complicated therapy to actually manufacture. It had six individual components all that had to get, be given at once. And we've boiled that down to just one now. And that's going to make things much easier to get through the regulatory regime that I'm sure we're going to talk about later in this call. Um, so I think, you know, we're super excited about this paper. I think I hope it's going to get a lot of attention and, and sort of wake the world up that we should be talking about HSV cure. No, that's absolutely wonderful, Keith. And, you know, those those seem like really big, big advances. And it feels disingenuous to ask, like, what are the next steps from there, you know, just given how much that paper shows? Well, we have a couple of priorities. There's a lot of priorities going on at once. And, uh, you know, I'm sure this question is going to come up. So we'll just talk about it right now. We're really very interested in, in, in working on HSV2. We're working actively on HSV2. And I know people, some people ask, you know, why is it only HSV1? And that's mostly technical reasons for why we've done that in the past. Other people say, don't forget HSV1 when you move to two. And we're doing them both. Uh, the viruses, as people know, are very similar. What we learn from one helps the other. But they're just different enough that we need to sort of tweak the therapies. It, it, it is a little bit different. And so that's taking some time. But I'm hoping that, that this is the year where we're actually going to have some some uh, a body of work with HSV2 that we can actually uh, present and get people excited about the idea of HSV2 cure as well. Well, I mean, this segues absolutely perfectly into the the first of the top five questions that were sent in from supporters everywhere, many of whom are here today. Um, and it was, what are our goals for 2024? What does Fred Hutch hope to accomplish with the HSV cure research this year? And what can the community look forward to this year? And Keith, you started talking about HSV2. Do you want to flesh out a little bit more of what you're hoping to do with HSV2? Yeah. So first of all, the, the genetic sequences of HSV1 and 2 are very similar, but they're not exactly the same. And what that means, if you remember that these enzymes that we use to attack the viral DNA, they're called meganucleases. And they're so specific that they don't work quite as well for two as they do one because the sequence is just a little bit different. So we've had to make new ones, basically. And so we have some of those. We're testing those. We know they have activity, um, and we're now seeing how well they can work in some animals. Um, you know, uh, I, but these these experiments take some time. So this is, this is something that's going to take most of the year at a minimum to sort of figure out um, – in, in a convincing enough way that, that it's, it withstands scientific scrutiny as well, let alone as we think about actually moving this into the clinic. But I think that if we can show that we have activity, that's the critical first step. If we get there, then, then we sort of know where we need to go from that point. 
Uh, yeah, exactly. Like you said, the pace of research is, is slow, but, you know, everybody is really excited to learn more about how these therapies work against HSV2. Dr. Anna Wald, I want to bring you in and ask you, what are your goals for 2024? You know, what can the community look forward to this year from your perspective? So there are two other areas in which we're actively uh, involved in trying to improve uh, care. One of them is HSV diagnostics. Um, as most people probably know, the way we diagnose herpes is, is quite imprecise, and a lot of the commercially available blood tests are really inaccurate. And this is really important to define who has the disease because we can't even target people for appropriate therapy until we can be sure that we know what they have, whether they really have HSV-1 infection or HSV-2 infection. So um, we're working with Dr. Alex Greninger to really define how well, or rather how poorly maybe, the commercial antibodies um, are working. And I just wanted to point out that FDA at the end of December put out an alert to providers that these commercial antibody tests are really not that good and that people should be informed that they are not infrequently inaccurate. So I think that's one area where there is still ongoing work, and I hope eventually we'll come up with a, a better diagnostic test. And then the other area is that there are several companies now that are launching um, studies for therapeutic and one also for prophylactic HSV vaccines. So a therapeutic vaccine is a vaccine that's given to a person who has an infection that hopefully will make the infection better, but without the need to take daily antivirals. Um, and there are three studies right now that are ongoing to look at new constructs for vaccines and how well uh, they work. That's absolutely brilliant that there, might, there is the potential for vaccine. But I want to go back to your first answer about the diagnostics, because there's a, there's a question uh, in the chat that sort of dovetails really nicely with this. And it's from uh, uh, Ari, who is asking, what if an in-home viral shedding test? is created. So so the testing that you're talking about, are you talking about diagnostics just to know whether somebody is HSV positive or is this a diagnostic for shedding? No, this is a diagnostic to know if somebody's uh, infected. And I do think somebody needs to invest in making a home shedding test. We have tests that can diagnose whether or not you have COVID that can be taken at home. And I think we need a similar test for HSV as well. Absolutely. I, I think this community could not agree with you more. So I want to move to the, the second um, question that the, the community sent in, and it's already in the chat as well. And this is for you, Dr. Jerome. Uh, Fred Hutch previously hoped to commence human trials by the end of 2023 at the latest. What are the remaining barriers to clinical trials, and when do you hope to start the process? Yeah, so <laughs> thanks, Guppy. You know, that's, that's a, that's a difficult question, um, for a couple reasons. One is we've, we've spent a lot of time over the last year and probably a little over a year really starting to understand the approval process for a gene therapy, let alone an in vivo gene editing approach, which really has never been done until extremely recently and for a unrelated uh, condition. So um, one thing we learned this is a, a substantially more complex than I hoped, um, or kind of naively probably thought. Um, so we have now access to some real experts, um, people who've taken kind of related, there's nothing exactly like we want to do, but the most related things we can find who've worked with FDA, who really understand the process. Um, we have access to some people who've actually worked at FDA in the past. Um, to really understand uh, exactly what we need to do, um, and and there's more. So um, you know, we're going to need to do some very formal and extremely careful safety studies in different model systems than we have done in the past, and that we have that we can do here at Fred Hutch. So um, lining up that expertise as well as actually having uh, the, the therapy manufactured in a way, uh, those tests have to be done with the same thing that you ultimately intend to put into people. So lining that all up 
it turns out to be a lot and we're working hard on it, but you know, it's incremental and there's never a big thing that you can actually like, there's not a paper on it. It's, it's just hard footwork. So we're doing all that. Um, but I think the reality is there's a lot that goes into the drug development process. And, and certainly, you know, I'm learning about that. We're starting to build a good team. Um, and we really want to get this out to everybody as quick as we can. Yeah, absolutely. And and so, you know, I do want to remind the audience that there aren't that many gene therapies that are available. I think the, the first gene therapy to treat was for sickle cell that just went out last year. So has that been one of the issues, Keith, is that there's just not that many examples to follow? Yeah, uh, for sure. There aren't that many approved uh, gene therapies at all. And then gene editing, like you're talking about, where you're actually cleaving something, there's only the one. Um, and then one thing we've heard over and over, and, I, and, and, and it probably ties into things that you know, the audience can do, is we get pushback, or there's concern about pushback that this is generally not a life-threatening infection. And, you know, we know that there are cases where it can be. And, and I think that the case that we need to make there is just the profound effect that, that HSV can have on people's lives. And so, um, you know, but, but those are things that the bar for safety is high. And, and the more that we see a gene therapy for sickle cell or a gene therapy for a cancer or a gene therapy for atherosclerosis or just other things, the, the, the broader it makes the path that we can go down. So I'm glad we're not absolutely the first anywhere. I think that would be tough. But, um, you know, we, 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 want, we want HSV to be right up as close to the front as we possibly can make it. Thank you, Keith. And like you said, right, like it, it's not a life-threatening disease, which is what, what could be a potential holdup. And so, you know, I'll turn to you, uh, Dr. Wald, like what, when we do eventually launch these trials, what will be the criteria that are used to select people for the trial? Because I'm sure there's plenty of people in the chat that are probably asking the same question of how do they get on this trial? You know, what will be, what, what will be our criteria for this? So I think in the first trials, we always are very focused on safety, and this obviously will be no exception. Um, so obviously people will have to have uh, documented uh, genital HSV2 infection um, in order for us to know that they're really at risk for developing potential complications and therefore may benefit from uh, therapy. And this is actually sort of to go back to my prior statement where diagnostics really are important, right, to make sure that we are able to tell who has HSV2 infection. And then the focus in general in early trials, so phase, two, phase one trials, is on people who are generally healthy, don't have other medical problems, so that if a complication does arise, we can really tie it clearly to uh, this intervention and uh, the risk to the person is as low as possible while we're still investigating and figuring out the dose, which are always the early studies. So these studies will be done very carefully and they will be done uh, with probably sort of a population on the younger side with documented HSV2 infection. Perfect. So we're just, so younger, healthier, you're looking for safety, and then we'll move to the efficacy part of it. Yes. So um, so I want to now move on to the third question that this, this audience sent in, and this is around the HSV2 and general model. And I know you touched a little bit about this in your paper, Keith, but it would be really interesting to learn more about how you were able to generate a genital model in in a, in a mouse model, which is, I don't know whether it's been done before, but I'm really curious to learn more about that. Yeah, so, well, so the, the paper that's coming out, just to be clear, is focused on HSV-1. Um, Correct. And so the HSV-2 work is coming, um, and, 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 and I mean, we've done some of it, but it's not, it's not flushed out enough that we can write a paper or really talk about it. We always want to be sure before we say something. That's why you'll see scientists be careful about what they say. It's like, we have some experiments, but we want to do them two, three, four times, show that we get the same result, that sort of thing. That way we don't get people's hopes up or, or, or move the scientific field in one direction and, and it turns out to be wrong. So we don't want to do that. Um, so, so uh, mice can be infected gently with HSV-1. Um, 
it's a little harder on the mouse than actually the infection around on the face. So if we have to give them some antivirals during the acute phase just to, to make sure that they're, they're, they're healthy during that part of it. Um, but the virus then goes latent and it, and it does all the things that it does around the head and neck or, or much like it does in people. The problem in mice in general and either around the head and neck or, or genitally has been that the mice don't reactivate their virus like humans do. So it doesn't go back out to the surface. And so in the, in, in one of the things that was a real advance in, in the paper that's about to be published is that we found a small molecule that I was actually familiar with through uh, my work in HIV cure, actually, uh, that there were reasons to think might work with HSV. And uh, it turns out it can wake herpes up. And so in mice, they start to shed the virus. And we measure it almost exactly like the studies that we do together with Anna Wald in, in our human study participants. You actually just swab uh, the affected region and you can find the virus and measure it. So it's, it's, it's almost exactly like that. And the mice actually shed almost exactly the same amount as people do. And, and for the same amount of time. So it's actually a really nice model. Um, so it's really cool. Um, for HSV2, um, really, you know, we want to move in. There's another model. Mice are okay, but even when they reactivate, they don't really get symptoms. They get lesions that are, that are real obvious. They have more of this asymptomatic shedding, which is, which is easy to measure in, in a good marker. But, um, so people, a lot of people on this call will know we, we're, we're, we've been interested in working, uh, in a guinea pig model for HSV2. That's the standard model. Um, especially for genital infections, so they can be infected around the head as well. Um, and the guinea pigs reactivate spontaneously. You don't need to give them this drug. The virus goes out to the surface. It even causes lesions that are that are quite similar to what a human would experience. Um, so we're excited about that. We're doing some studies here. We're doing some studies with uh, with the NIH. So I think some folks know that are actually being done in their facilities. Um, so that's really exciting. And there we can do HSV2 or, or even a little bit of HSV1 work. Um, but that's really the model system, I think, that really will most, as convincing as possible, show that we have a meaningful effect that will allow us to go into a human trial. So we need to show that meaningful effect, safety in some of the other animals, and then ultimately we'll do that first in human trial that Anna just spoke about. So I'm going to try and summarize what I heard about the HSV, is that you've, you, you have the therapy and you're ready to go into preclinical testing and you're starting those preclinical tests with HSV2 yeah. at this present moment. Yeah. But with HSV1, yes. what was really excited was you talked about, you also touched on the shedding model. And so actually, uh, Anna, can I ask you to talk more about, you know, the shedding in humans and how you, you test for that? And will that also be part of the uh, clinical trials for the cure? Mm -hmm. So I think the issue of shedding and how we use uh, shedding in developing new treatments and therapies is really something that our group at the University of Washington, Fred Hodge, has focused on for the last uh, several decades. Um, and we have designed the system that relies not just on recurrences, which are infrequent and very hard to measure their severity, but to really just look at viral shedding. Because even when people don't have um, clear outbreaks of genital herpes, they often sh will shed the virus, and that's actually what leads to transmission. And that is for people affected by this infection, one of the main problems, right, this issue of shedding and the unpredictability of the shedding. So when we measure it, we measure it both before an intervention and after an intervention. And that is a nice way for us to be able to then tell um, to what extent the intervention, for example, a new antiviral, uh, has reduced the viral shedding. And I think that's the model we're also going to use in evaluating the gene therapy approach that Keith is working on. Uh, we will first measure genital shedding uh, in somebody, then they will get the therapeutic, and then again we will look whether or not the shedding can be abolished. Uh, by this therapy without the use of antiviral drugs. Wow, that would be absolutely amazing because, you know, it, it's it's a fear for so many in this community that they don't know that they're shedding, and that's just been such a huge part of the uncertainty around this disease. So that, that's really quite inspiring to hear. Um, I'm going to move to the fourth question in here, which is around 
funding and I, I guess you know how has the community funding been used in relation to the research and how is Fred Hutch doing regarding funding for research and potential clinical trials and what about other sources like the NIH or private sources so um, you know uh, separating so NIH is the government funding which is for often for data and science that has advanced a little bit and data, funding from private sources is often used to fuel that early stage research so Keith what are your thoughts around funding where are we at and how has this community been crucial to keep our research moving yeah the first thing I have to say is this community has been absolutely essential and thank you so much because we would have actually had to substantially cut back recently if not well, we wouldn't have closed down i think but we would have had to, to to really slow the work um so we've been working to get our nih grant for this work uh, re refunded um we haven't been successful yet at that but we are extremely persistent and it will be reviewed again soon <laughs> um and I'm, I'm optimistic i think you know the um, we, we continue to try to do a better job explaining to, to folks why this is such an important issue, why it should be a priority, um, and why we think the work is so promising. Um, in, in, in a, in a, and I really hope we've made a compelling case this time. Um, you know, funding in academia from the NIH can be variable and grants come and go and, and, and there's a certain luck of the draw to it. I mean, it's an imperfect process along the way. Um, so just thank goodness that, that this community has really stepped up to kind of keep us whole during that time. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I a lot of folks have heard me say, uh, you know, we're, at least there's a lot of Americans on here, you know, we're all paying our taxes and, and some of that ought to be going to herpes research. And I feel that strongly and I've told folks at NIH and some of it is, let's, you know, I don't want to over exaggerate, but I do want some of it to, to, to be about cure. Um, so, so that's been uh, fantastic. You asked a little bit about private sector funding. Uh, we, we have some, we've gotten some of that and, and that's been able to support some of the, these, getting these regulatory experts and so forth and starting to talk about actually manufacturing the clinical grade AV, which is phenomenally expensive and, and sort of beyond anything we've been talking about in terms of amounts of money that that will end up costing. So, you know, I think that this is something where, there's 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 sort of different streams that hopefully will all work together to to keep this this thing moving forward because it just we need it to happen so quickly. And Gabby, if I can say one more thing, you know, I was talking about you know, and I, and I, I don't want to be too hard on them. So um, I, I sit on the NIAID Council actually, so that's the, the the Council for the Allergy and Infectious Disease Institute of NIH, and so we just had our meeting on Monday. Uh, and Jeannie Marazzo, who's the new director. Uh, she actually did some of her training here in Seattle. It's great. Anna knows her very well. I know her very well. Um, so she's the new director, took over Tony Fauci's job. At that. So that's the job, right? Um, and so she gives a, a, a short speech uh, about kind of priorities and things. And it, it, this is all public. I don't know exactly where you'd go to find it, but you could root around and, and, and find it. But she actually calls out uh, the importance of expanding HSV research, which is really exciting. Talked about the strategic plan they talked about. That was all. So I was, I was so thrilled when I heard it. I was just so excited to hear that. I feel like what a success story. And then she said, and herpes virus, herpes simplex cure. And she stopped and said, we need to start using the word cure when we talk about HSV. And I thought, what a win for this group and, and the advocates where we've gone from Absolute, you know, if you talked about that, people thought it was insanity five or 10 years ago to the director calling that out in the speech. So congratulations to, to the activists here. We're going to get some momentum and, 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 you know, we're going to turn this thing into a reality. Absolutely. And thank you for, for actually sharing that story, Keith. I mean, it, it's really brings hope to so many in this audience. And, you know, as, as hard as it is with, when NIH funding doesn't doesn't go away, just just to know that there is support at the NIAID for herpes cure is is really reinforcing. So, uh, thank you. Um, I I will move to the last question from this group, and 
It's around addressing other researchers' findings on gene therapy and HSV infections. There's another company that they say has used um, gene therapy to target HSV mm -hmm. keratitis and able to eliminate replication. What are your thoughts on that work? And does, does it pro provide hope that gene therapy might be the right therapeutic curative approach? Keith, I'll come to you first, and then maybe Anna, I'd love your yeah. thoughts as well. Well, sure. I mean, you already know that I think that gene therapy is the right therapeutic approach. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working on it. So I'm, first of all, really excited that there are other groups working on this. This is a Chinese company, so I don't actually know these these people personally. Um, but it's great that there are other people working on it. It's great there are other, other countries' money going into it because, you know, this stuff's not cheap. Um, so that's that's all good. It's a different group. I wish there were more. I hope that we can draw more people. And I think attention by the NIH that this is a priority will bring other, you know, other researchers. We can just, we need just smart people on this problem, right? You know, in terms of the, of the details of the study, you know, it's, it's really not my work. So I haven't really seen the primary data. I, you know, I'd, I'd say I'm cautiously optimistic that this looks like it's, it's going in the right direction, but we'll need to watch this story kind of unfold over the next couple of years. Absolutely. Thank you, Keith. And Anna, I'm going to pivot this question a little bit because there's also an, a question in the chat, which is asking how, uh, how long do you think for this cure or vaccination will be available for human use? And, you know, while the HSV therapy from this other company is, is great, I, I feel like you can say a little bit more about the vaccination. So thank you, Jella, for asking that question. And Anna, what are your thoughts on the vaccination piece? The vaccination with the vaccines that are currently um, in clinical yeah. trials. So no, I, I think that that would be great to spell out that they are in clinical trials. Yeah, exactly. And they're in early clinical trials. I mean, they just moved from sort of first in men, which is the way we first talk about trials for the first when the intervention is initially given to human beings after being given only to animals. And now we're trying to assess how well it works. And I think it's really interesting that all of the companies that are doing these vaccine trials are using shedding for their primary outputs to see whether or not these therapies work. But the first trial is going to last at least two years. You know, we're going to be able to see in everybody, right, in a large group of people, how well it works. And then if it works, it'll have to move to a phase three trial, which is probably a few more years in addition to that. So I think if everything goes well, maybe in five years, we will have a therapeutic vaccine that's available. So uh, in about five years, a therapeutic vaccine that's available to everyone, but there are trials that are currently open that people can go to. How many different vaccine trials are out there that you know about? So I'm aware of three uh, vaccine trials uh, that are currently uh, ongoing. Um, and there are people can go to clinicaltrials.gov and uh, look for them and see if there is a center near you in which uh, you could enroll. We've actually been shocked how quickly they've been enrolling. Uh, people are very excited about it. The field has been very dry for several years with no new products. Uh, so this is uh, truly very exciting and we're hearing, hearing a lot of enthusiasm from the participants about all three uh, of the trials. That, that's really exciting. So I think we're done with all the questions that were that were sent in ahead of time. And now I'm going to move to some more questions from the chat, which are which has been blowing up. And so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see all of these questions. And I, I want to start with um, an interesting question from Warren for you, um, Dr. Jerome. And it's around how the gene therapy interacts or would interact with acyclovir or other common HSV antivirals. like, And so I'm wondering if that's another step in the research that needs to be done or considered. Generally, when we've tested it, tested our therapy in the animal models, the animals aren't getting acyclovir at the time of treatment. Um, sometimes they get it, as I mentioned earlier, during the acute phases of their infection, just to keep them as healthy as possible. Um, so I don't think that, ideally, we wouldn't, you know, we're trying to basically keep people from having to take a daily drug, you know, basically to not shed, not have symptoms without having to take a drug, right? I mean, that's that's sort of what we think of for cure. Um, 
I do think, though, in maybe a related vein, our approach may end up working really well with vaccines, actually. Um, our approach should provide some protection from a new infection, so that would be great. Um, but, but the other possibility is that we may get almost all the virus. You know, we're going to be honest here, right? I mean, you see the numbers. We have 90 or 98 percent reduction in the virus, but there's still there's still a couple percent there. We don't think that that necessarily is going to cause a lot of trouble, but that remains to be shown. But maybe you know that last little bit you cover up with the, with with the vaccine, and the vaccine might not be work as well as we hope without reducing the virus by that 90 or 98 percent. So, you know, I think it remains to be seen, but we're very aware of the utility of combinations of therapies, and 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 when they make sense, we do experiments with them. Um, and you know, sometimes they pan out, sometimes they don't. But but it's it's an important concept. That that is yeah, that totally makes sense. Uh, I'm going to move to a question from Michelle, uh, and I think this is for you, Anna. Would you know? And it speaks to the the concern in the community. Would you consider HSV as a pandemic? And do you think it would help to sort of change the designation that would help it get funding or more? coverage? Hmm. So, uh, from an epidemiologist perspective, this is not a pandemic. This is an endemic, uh, which means that this virus has been within human populations uh, for as long as we've existed. Uh, initially, actually, humans had HSV-1, and then we acquired HSV-2. So, we have two herpes simplex uh, viruses. We're the only primate that actually has uh, two. Um, and it's been with us for a very, very long time. Um, so it's hard to call it a pandemic, which really refers to rates that are above the background. We're just very high in background, and I think people are sort of lulled into complacency as a result, um, that they think this is just normal state of nature. And I think it's really important to point out that it's not, and we should be doing something curative about it, not just making small changes in people's lives, which is what we're doing with current antivirals. That absolutely makes sense. Um, I'm going to move to a question from Avery, and, you know, this is for maybe some people who have not been following your work quite as closely for so long, Keith and Anna, and, and it's sort of why is the virus so hard to cure? And, you know, why has it been such a challenge for so long? And why do we have to go to these gene therapy measures for it? Yeah, that's that's a great question, and that's something that virologists spent a lot of time figuring out. Now we kind of got it figured out now, but it's really an important question. Um, so if you think about a virus like I don't know, let's say you get flu, for example, flu comes in, comes in your nose, infects in your respiratory tract, maybe your lung, and it does its thing, replicates, makes bunch of copies, but your body clears it and it goes away. And two weeks later, if you recover, or three weeks later, you don't have any flu anymore okay so lots of viruses are like that but the herpes viruses in general and there's other ones that aren't simplex that cause like chicken pox or, or, mm -hmm. or um, different different things um, herpes viruses all have this characteristic that they they have a particular cell in the body that they like to go into and they establish a thing called latency that just means they go in there they basically go to sleep they hide maybe they're dormant at least you know get a thesaurus here but um, they go in and hide, and for herpes simplex, it's the it's the neurons to innervate the site where you were infected, right? So if you're infected around the mouth, it's kind of up in your head. If you're infected genitally, it's sort of near your spinal cord. Um, and then the virus just sits in those cells for life and almost does nothing. So the immune system can't attack it. Our, our current drugs don't attack it. And then every once in a while, it wakes up, goes back out to the surface, along the nerve paths and then it goes looking for new 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 hosts basically right and so that's why these things are so difficult to cure is because we've never had a drug that says can we go after the virus that's lying dormant in those nerves and that's exactly what we're doing with our therapy that we literally send a little molecule down there that looks through the nerves for that latent virus if it sees it it destroys it and gets rid of it and that's completely different from how any other current therapy works. That absolutely makes sense. And it, it sort of then brings up the question, which somebody else asked in the chat, which was why 
you know, why have we not been able to control it like we control HIV with a functional cure, uh, you know, so far? Uh, and I guess that's a question for Anna. Maybe Anna take a first stab at it and then we'll get to Keith. Um, sure. I, mean, I, you know, trained at the beginning of the HIV epidemic, uh, so I'm very familiar with these advances. And we actually didn't make a lot of headway uh, in HIV control until we started using combination therapy. Uh, for many viruses, it turns out that that's really an essential approach. Um, and for herpes, we're not there yet, right? We have one class of antivirals that we're using. There is a new class that's being um, evaluated. An example of this new class is pertilivir, um, and it has a different mechanism of action. But I think from a development of antivirus standpoint, we need to be looking at combination therapies, and not only combination therapies of two different antivirals, but combinations between vaccines and antivirals, as well as cure approaches potentially and vaccines or cure approaches and antivirals to really optimize uh, the way that we manage people who are um, who have HSV infection. So, yeah, because with the HIV treatments that came out first, there's it's basically a combination of three different drugs that target different parts of the Viruses life cycle and sort of stop it at three different points. What, you know, with, and you're saying that this new drug, Pertelivir, is the first one that targets a different part of the virus's life cycle than the traditional antivirals do. So, can you talk about which different parts they, they each hit? So, the nucleoside analogs interfere with the replication, so they interfere with the polymerase. Um, and the pertilivir and other drugs in that class uh, interfere with uh, helicase primase uh, enzyme. So it's just a different step in the replication of the virus that prevents uh, the virus from being able to uh, reactivate. So perfect. So they, they stop the virus from being able to make copies at two different parts of, of the, the process. Yes. Okay. And so maybe starting to think about other drugs that affect the virus in other parts of the process. Um, thank you for that. And so I wanna move to another question from the chat, and this is a really interesting one um, about your gene therapy, Keith. And you know, you talked about the virus life cycle and how it goes through the neurons and all the way back. Uh, do you think the, does your gene therapy do exactly the same? Does it follow the same path? Does it go to the same neurons? And is it possible that it's not hitting some of the neurons where the virus might be hiding? Yeah, so that's something we actually looked at and we published some data on that in the 2020 Nature Communications paper that, that where we, we literally looked at individually at, at neurons and said, which ones have herpes and which ones have AAV in them? And there's a very good overlap. It's not perfect. And we don't know whether that's just because of the sensitivity of the methods that we use which we probably favor, or if truly there are some herpes infected cells that just aren't getting AAV yet. Um, the fact that, you know, at the time we were getting at best maybe 90% uh, elimination of virus. And now if you heard in the, in, in the genital model, we're getting 98, 99%. So that tells us, you know, we're getting pretty close to all of them. And what's the cause of that 1% left over? I suspect that it's just virus that keeps repairing itself effectively. And remember, that's only one month after the therapy. So one thing we're doing now is just where we just kind of watch watch the animals. How do they look in four months or six months or a year? Um, so, so it may be that this is just continuing and, and it's just getting better all the time. So we're trying to tell us all those things apart. But it's a really important scientific question. Um, and, and we did some very complicated experiments to say it looks like they're getting to the same place. And so, you know, Based on that, are you, are you thinking that it would require repeated applications of the gene therapy, or do you think it would just last long enough that when the virus reactivates, there's still some gene therapy that's left over that would take yeah. care of what is so, latent? Yeah, that's a good question. The, the, the virus doesn't need to reactivate for this to work, and that makes it different from the other drugs that only work when the virus is actually reactivated. So it can be dormant sleeping and we can still find it with this one and that's a critical difference um you know i think that 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 that, that this this whole question about dormancy and in waking up 
is really, you know, a critical one. <clears throat> and one really, um, you know, exciting possibility is that, uh, you know, over time, because this, the, the therapy does persist for quite some time, it's going to have that op- opportunity for, for, for cumulative effect. Uh, in terms of retreatment, um, when you give a particular, what we call a serotype of AAV, you pretty much can't use that again in a, in a person because people make antibodies to the AAV. Um, we can probably technically get around that because there's other serotypes. And if you know what, what you gave before, you can give a different one. Um, but I don't think we're going to need to do that. Honestly, all of our experiments are pretty much so far with just one therapy. And that's sort of the ideal time, get this taken care of and, and be done with it. That's, that's the product I hope we come up with. Perfect. Um, I think, um, you know, given how global this audience is, you know, when, when they start dropping their countries in the chat, we had people from Australia, from Saudi Arabia, from India. Um, you know, one question is, you know, whatever gene therapy we develop here, how do we get it out to the rest of the world? And, and what, what is its availability going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So from, from day one, what, whether we're talking about this work for herpes or the work that I've done toward an HIV cure or even hepatitis. Goal number one is if we, I'm not going to work out and if it's something that's only going to be available to rich countries, it's just, that's just not something I'm interested in doing. So I want to make something that's available to everybody. And so part of the driver of, of, I told you we sort of simplified this down from six things to one is that kind of, if you think about what that does to the cost, you know, you've already reduced the cost multiple fold ultimately when this thing is made, right? Um, we're, we're doing a lot of work to try to reduce the dose as low as possible. That'll obviously just, it'll give regulatory, regulatory agencies more comfort around safety. Lower doses are always better, but also just means that the, the physical act of manufacturing this will be much cheaper. And so we're really thinking about that, uh, right now everywhere. Uh, in terms of making this available everywhere, you know, the, I think we talked about, you know, the initial trial will probably be done here with Anna here in Seattle. Um, but quickly we'd like to move internationally. And certainly when this becomes a real approved thing, uh, treatment, you can, you can go get from your doctor. We want that to be available everywhere in the world. And the beauty of, of Fred Hutch and UW is that, you know, Fred Hutch is the home of the HIV vaccine trials network and we have a global reach we've done hiv trials across the world and we can easily leverage that infrastructure and so that i'm just really excited for when this starts going through that process as well and i want to turn and ask you a question because there's i'm seeing two different sets of things in the chat where people are talking about doctors telling patients that they shouldn't be worried and it's not a big deal versus other people who are in the chat talking about how much it has altered their lives and, and the stigma and the and the fear that comes with it. You know, what would be your advice to somebody who's newly diagnosed here? So I think unfortunately both are true. And it really it's one of those conditions that it really depends, you know, who you are. So for example, if you're in a relationship with somebody who has genital HSV2 infection, and then you acquire from them and you have very mild disease, a lot of those people are really happy that they finally got it because it's the discordance or the fear of transmission that's associated with a lot of the distress, right? So that's an example where people don't really mind having it. And for a lot of people, it is very mild. And then there's a substantial number of people for whom it is quite severe, difficult to control with antivirals, they have some neurological complications potentially. And of course, there's this overwhelming issue that you might be infectious. And I think that really impacts uh, people's, um, the way they view themselves and their sexuality. And I think sexual health is really important to people. Um, so it can have a devastating impact. It's just, yeah, it is. It is or when something is, is, is an and, or do you think as somebody asked in the chat would, if we advocate for testing during pap smears and routine checkups, would that help? Or is that, does that not talk to the shedding aspect and 
that still doesn't get us where we need to get. So I don't think with pap smears it would work because even if you were shedding at that moment, right, it doesn't mean you're shedding later. And if you're not shedding, it doesn't mean you don't have the infection. Um, and that's actually been one of the issues a long time ago when we used viral culture. People would come in with lesions, viral culture often missed it. And then the person would call the clinic three days later and would be told your culture is negative and they would walk away thinking they don't have the infection. So that is not a really good way of diagnosing infection. So we do need an accurate antibody test to say who's infected. And I just wanted to add that 80% of people who have HSV2 infection have such mild infection that they don't know that they have it, which on one hand is good for them. On the other hand, that's how they transmit is because they're not aware that they have it and they are um, unable to take precautions or to even inform their partners that they might be at risk for transmitting this infection. So I think we both need a diagnostic that will tell if you have the infection and we need a test for those people who have the infection to tell whether or not you're shedding it so people can uh, be safer when engaging in uh, sex. So you're advocating for two layers of testing, just better tests for initial detection and tests for shedding that can be done at home to give people Correct. peace of mind. Yes. Perfect. Um, there's a really interesting question from Warren for Keith that I had not thought about as well, which was after the gene therapy neutralizes latent virion particles in the sacral ganglia, where does where do the neutralized virion particles go? I'm assuming it's just a function of cutting the, the DNA, but is there is there more to that? Do, you know, does does the DNA persist? Oh, that's a great question. So the DNA doesn't persist. We can't detect it. Um, so we think it's degraded. Um, well, we're almost sure it's degraded, but we really don't know the precise mechanism by which that happens, other than to say that the cell, <clears throat> the cells are really good at not wasting biological material in them. So cells have mechanisms. If you break down a protein, for example, your, your cell doesn't need any more. The cell will typically break that down a little bit and then reuse parts of it. And the stuff that goes into nucleic acids, the individual uh, nucleotides, are really, really valuable to the cell. So typically those get recycled, but but into into the good stuff you want. It's not herpes anymore. It just you know goes into into your RNA or your DNA. You know it, it, when things replicate and, and and it is used for something good. So I think I'm going to move to this the one question that keeps coming up from many people in the chat, and I'm gonna take it in two phases. And this audience is really committed to a cure, to better testing, to better advocacy. And the first part is, what can they do to advocate for moving forward research, for moving forward funding? Um, you know, I'll start with you, Anna, what, for those that want to go into advocacy around herpes and better tests and better cure, what would, should they be doing? Oh, I, you know, I think there are uh, several issues. Um, one of them is that the NIH budget, budget actually is either going to be flat or be cut uh, this year. And I think that's a huge problem for all research, uh, including HSV. Um, and in fact, there's some concern that the NIAID budget may be uh, especially at risk, uh, given sort of the way people feel about, some people feel about uh, NIAID after the uh, pandemic. So I think advocating to your representatives that this is important to maintain research funding uh, in this country in general will have an effect that's positive on STD uh, research as well. I think we're very lucky that Dr. Morazzo uh, has taken uh, the helm of NIAID. She's a very committed uh, researcher in the STI uh, field, one of the leading ones uh, in the world, and the fact that she articulated, uh, as she has been for a few years now, that HSV is important and that now cure is important. I think it's um, fantastic news. And I'll move to Keith to ask, like, what is the single biggest obstacle? People are really excited about the guinea pig tests. If you could talk about that and what is the obstacles to moving to the guinea pig test? Is it staffing? Is it funding? What would be needed to move things forward faster? Yeah, well, it probably is. It is. There, 
working with guinea pigs is very resource intensive. It's all, it doesn't all come, but to first approximation, they're just bigger. I mean, you know, they take up more space. They take more care. They're, um, they, 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 they require an intensity of care that's different from mice. I guess that's the easiest way to put it. It's, it's a lot of things, but like literally the lighting matters and you need to, you want to be kind of quiet around them. They get nervous. I mean, there's a lot of things. So, um, it's really not practical to, to think about doing as many studies in guinea pigs. I mean, maybe one way to think about this is, is the mouse studies are easier. So to kind of get things generally figured out, we have felt, and I think, I, I think it's been proven correct that, that by starting, well, starting in, in, in the test tube in the laboratory, but, but for the first animal work being in mice where we can kind of get it worked out and then go to these more complicated models and ultimately do the, you know, the very formal safety studies and then humans, you know, this is this is sort of the process it needs to take. And, and I think guinea pigs play a very important role there because they truly are the best model for human disease that we have. Um, so we'll we'll fight through the difficulties and in, in all of that. But 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 they do have their specific role to play in the process. So is is the hold up just like, you know, because of how intensive it is, do you need more staffing or more funding? Do you need to make more virus because they're bigger animals and you'll have to give more virus <laughs> yeah. as a dose? You know, what, what's the biggest it's, need? It's sort of all of the above, Duffy, really. I, I mean, it's truly all of those. It's just resources in general. And, and I'll say it, it isn't like guinea pig stuff hasn't been happening. I mean, we were really thrilled to get to work with, with NIH some, uh, and we're thrilled to be able to do our own ex experiments here. Um, I will tell you, we've spent a little bit more time on this paper that we talked about at the beginning than I kind of wanted to, and that's required some extra mouse studies, but there is a ton of data in that paper. I mean, if anybody here decides to try to read it, I mean, you know, set aside an afternoon or something, because there's a lot. Um, even the reviewers said that this last time. So this is a pretty dense read, I think is what they called it. Um, so that's all great, but, but I think that to some degree, you know, we, we, we really want to get to get to the guinea pigs and answer those questions to say, does this does this help symptomatic disease? Right. And we, you know, we showed we can reduce the viral loads. We can reduce the shedding. Now, can we make lesions better? And I think that that that's the trifecta. Then, then we we have some confidence that we can really help people's lives be better. And, I, you know, I, I want to say, like, thank you to both of you for the amount of work you've done. I'm going to quote uh, Gerardo Cortez as, as I close out this program. Just. The, one of the people in the chat who says, thank you so much, Dr. Keith Jerome and Anna Wald and everyone at Fred Hutch for all your hard work on finding a cure for HSV and recognizing that it affects a lot of us. The Nobel Prize is well-deserved and you know we're ever grateful to both of you and we are ever grateful to everybody in this chat for coming. Thank you so much. You have been tremendous supporters to Fred Hutch and we are grateful for your dedication and support. We know how much this means to you for everyone whose lives have been altered by HSV, and we are going to keep working until we have a cure. To learn more about the research, go to our website, fredhutch.org. And if you'd like to give directly to Dr. Jerome's HSV research, go to fredhutch.org slash HSV to make a gift. Every doll counts. Thank you so much to the more than 250 people who came. We appreciate you. Have a great rest of your morning.